Good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Vanessa. And my name is Spencer. And if this is your first time worshiping with us today, I'd like to welcome you. If you've been here before, I'd like to welcome you back. I am just so thankful that you took some time to spend with us this morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you for everyone who's online watching. Lord, we pray for each soul. Bless us and keep us, Lord, until you come, is my prayer. Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, CCC. It's my privilege to bring before you a few announcements for this week. And if you would like to review these announcements or be placed on our mailing list, please go to ColumbiaCenterSDA.org forward slash bulletin and you'll be able to see them there or receive this by email. This morning, we want to take a moment to give a special thank you to our member care and nurture leader and team members who provided a wonderful, amazing seniors luncheon last Sabbath afternoon. We had a great time in food and fellowship and fun. It was wonderful to see our seniors as well as to look at some of the pictures from way back when. So we want to we just once again thank our member Karen Nurture team for planning such a wonderful event. And that was just a foretaste of things to come once we are able to re-enter our building full force. Next, we would like you to save the date on August the 20th for a community outreach ministry program. On Sabbath, August the 20th at 5 p.m., you will have an opportunity to meet the families that we have been ministering to and serving for the past two years. They will actually be here to get some of the things, the provisions that we are providing, but you will also have an opportunity to meet them. It's gonna be a time of fellowship and fun. There will be giveaways and refreshments, so please stay tuned for additional information and updates on this. But that is our community outreach program on Sabbath, August the 20th at 5 p.m. I want to thank all of our members who attended last week's town hall meeting, our church business session. We had a great turnout. We got some wonderful information, a comprehensive review and an update, a pictorial, if you please, of the progress that has been made and is being made here at the church site. Uh, progress is continuing to be made and uh, the plumbers are done now where we're just waiting on the inspection. The electricians are completing their work and we hope to be in our facility as soon as possible. This afternoon at 3 p.m., we will definitely be having our Christian Journey Bible class. We've had to postpone it the last couple of weeks because of other events, but this afternoon at 3 p.m., the Christian Journey will be looking at the spiritual discipline of fasting, so you won't want to miss this from the biblical perspective. Well, this week we want to recognize many of our members who had birthdays. They had another trip around the sun. Last Sabbath, Sister Emily Reed celebrated her birthday. This week also Bill Ballard, Mary Johnson, and Charles Reynolds Sr. We so certainly hope that you had a wonderful birthday celebration and that you will have a spirit-filled year ahead. Again, happy birthday. Once again, if you'd like to receive these announcements or be placed on our mailing list, simply go to columbiacentersda.org forward slash bulletin. May God bless you today as we continue to worship him in the beauty of his holiness. I invite all our CCC members as well as our friends who are watching this stream to join me as I approach God's throne of grace. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you this morning because you are our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, and our prayer answering God. We come, Lord, 
in the midst of a world that seems to be spinning out of control and all the circumstances around us that cause for anxiety and fear and concern. As we come this morning, we thank you that we serve a God who hears and answers prayer and who will reach into our circumstances to do that which is best for us. As we come this morning, we present our praise and thanks for all the blessings that we have received at your hand. And we present all our concerns. You know them all, Lord. Those that we have dared to speak aloud, those that we have written, and those that are in the deepest recesses of our hearts, such deep and personal desires that only you can know about. And we thank you that you see and hear each one of us and our hearts cries. So hear the pleas this morning for healing for all those who feel afflicted in some way because of health challenges. Place your healing hand upon them. Be with those, Lord, who are concerned about finances, those who are concerned about family. Lord, meet the needs of each one. We pray for our children, for the challenges that they face growing up in this difficult world. We ask that you place a hedge of protection around them and give us godly wisdom and help us to lean on you as we pray for them, for their deliverance. We pray for those who have been adversely affected by the circumstances around us. And we ask that you would bless our efforts to work with you to reach into their difficult circumstances and provide whatever we can to alleviate their concerns and grant that in doing so, they may see in us hope in a God who delivers. We ask for wisdom and guidance for our nation's leaders and our church's leaders and ask that you will remind them that righteousness exalts a nation and so they need to look to you for wisdom and guidance. We ask that your hand will rest upon your manservant this morning as he brings us a word from you. May our hearts be open and ready to receive it so that as we go into a new week, the words you send our way will ring in our ears and inform the way we walk and talk this week. Hear our breathings and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And we thank you and praise you in the name of your Son and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and Amen.
Good morning, church family, and happy Sabbath. We hope that you have had a wonderful week and uh, you're celebrating the fact that the Lord brought you through to another Sabbath day where we can come and worship together. Before I begin today, I want to first thank the Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church Gospel Choir for bringing us that wonderful selection entitled Healing. Today, we're continuing our series on church challenges and the subtitle is Walking in the Light. But before we begin, I invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you have promised us healing. Not only the physical restoration, but more importantly, the spiritual revival and rejuvenation that comes from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, whom you promised to all of those who would obey you. And so this morning on this beautiful Sabbath day, we simply ask for you to come in and abide with us. Help us to keep our hearts and minds and ears attuned to your teaching today. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. The book of Isaiah chapter two and verse five is a key pivotal text for us today. As we started last week, of identifying the various church challenges that are facing us as we are on the precipice of the second coming of our Lord and Savior. We discovered last week that there are internal as well as external threats to God's church, challenges that we must rise to the occasion if we are going to be successful in prosecuting the mission of the kingdom of heaven here in Colombia and around the world. The book of Isaiah and the book of Acts are the two primary uh, texts of scriptures that we will be addressing, but today it really is looking at Isaiah and the message that he had for God's people. Hopefully we will be able to extrapolate meaningful messages and lessons that we can apply to our personal growth and journey into Christ likeness. Isaiah here, uh, is a prophet, not just a prophet, that, but the first major prophet that we find in the Old Testament. Uh, his book is indicative of the plan of salvation. In fact, his name means the Lord's salvation or the Lord is my salvation. Isaiah had a prophetic ministry that spanned 60 years. In the first chapter of Isaiah, we discover that he, his ministry covered the span of four various kings from Uzziah uh, to Jotham to Ahaz to Hezekiah. Uh, he had a rich history with God's people, but he was God's mouthpiece, God's spokesperson who was standing in the breach. God's people had defied him. They had turned their back on the promises. They had broken the covenant by adopting the lifestyle and the religious practices of the people in the land of Canaan, the very people whom God had dispossessed and had given the land to the children of Israel. So Isaiah had a very important ministry that he needed to fulfill. In chapter one, he starts off by uh, a word from the Lord where the Lord is basically telling them that, that they had rebelled against him. In fact, let me just read a few verses to you in Isaiah chapter one and, and verse two. The Lord says, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Verse five, the whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. So here is a dire predicament, a dismal portrayal 
of God's people whom he had handpicked. In fact, as you go on in the book of Isaiah, he talks about that vineyard. Israel was his chosen vineyard that he cleared the ground and, 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 and dug a trench around it and planted the vine, the, the, the vine there and fertilized it and watched over it. And when God expected to bring forth great, it, for it to bring forth grapes, it brought forth poisonous grapes. And the Lord says, what more could I have done to this vine and to this vineyard? Well, this is the message that Isaiah is having to bring to the people of God. And it became a message of strict consternation. And many times they rebelled against it. And after years and years and years of entreaty and the gospel invitation for repentance and turning back to God and turning away from their sins, finally God had to use the Assyrian Empire and then the Babylonian Empire as the vessels to bring about chastisement and repentance to God's people. Now, the Assyrians were the dominant force in the ancient Near Eastern world. Uh, they were quite brutal uh, and they specialized in dehumanizing their people and they brought about disorder and upheaval that wreaked fear and hopelessness in the hearts of the people that they conquered. They not only destroyed the people, but they eradicated cultures and they used a system of displacement. In fact, in 2 Kings chapter 17 and verses 24 through 34, I won't take the time to read it now, but it is it, it reveals this plan that the Assyrians had. In these verses, we find out that the Assyrians would conquer these other lands and the other people, and they would conquer people from Babylon and, and Chutna and Ava, and, and they would then repopulate the cities of Samaria with these other uh, foreigners. First of all, they would displace the Jews, send them across the world, the then, known, the then known world, and then they would bring all of these different people from other lands that had been subjugated by the Assyrians and then planted them in Samaria as well as in Judah. Well, what happened from a sociological perspective is that there became religious syncretism. In other words, these different people brought along their own cultural biases, their cultural practices, their religious beliefs, and their systems of indoctrination, and there became an unholy amalgamation, a blending of all of these various idolatrous practices and religions that married up with God's people. In fact, it became so bad, 2 Kings chapter 17 reveals that the Lord actually sent lions there into Samaria, destroyed a number of people, and God's remnant prophets and people there were told the Assyrian king, the reason why this is happening is because you are disregarding the law of God. In fact, let me just read a couple of verses for you. 2 Kings chapter 17 and... Uh, verse 24, the king of Assyria transported these groups of people from Babylon and these other areas. Verse 25, but since these foreign settlers did not worship the Lord when they first arrived, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. Verse 26, the people you have sent to live in the towns of Samaria do not know the religious customs of the God of the land. He sent lions among them to destroy them because they have not worshiped him correctly. The king, verse 27, tells us that the king of Assyria then selected a priest who was directed to go to the city to teach the people the law of the Lord. But notice what happened in verse 29. But these various groups of foreigners also continued to worship their own gods in town after town where they lived. They placed their idols at the pagan shrines that the people of Samaria had built. These new residents worshiped the Lord, but they also appointed from among themselves all sorts of people as priests 
to offer sacrifices at their places of worship. And though they worship the Lord, listen to me now, they continued to follow their own gods according to the religious customs of the nations from which they came. And this is still going on today. They continue to follow their former practices instead of truly worshiping the Lord and obeying the decrees, regulations, instructions, and commands he gave the descendants of Jacob, whose name he changed to Israel. Here is this religious syncretism. Here is where they had God's people had disobeyed him and he therefore had to use the Assyrians and then the Babylonians to chastise them. And the Assyrians then took people, other people who they had subjugated, transplanted them into the land of Samaria, into the northern tribes and then to Judah. And even though they taught them the way of the Lord and some of them followed it, but they also commingled their beliefs with the practices of Judaism. Reminds me of what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians. How can light live and commingle with darkness? You see, this is the enemy's plan. This is part of his strategy. He takes a little bit of truth and mixes it with a little bit of error. And there you have this unholy alliance. And this is what caused Israel to apostatize. This is what caused them to move away from the word of God, from the instructions of God, and to reject the principles of God. This is how this great plan of salvation and the gospel that was revealed in the sacrificial system became diluted. There's a message here I hope that you're getting that is applicable for us today. So here is a stark situation. In fact, the people of God, because of this, this spiritual degradation and deterioration and a movement away from the Lord, they were brought into captivity, but there is a message of hope that Isaiah gives them in Isaiah chapter two and verse five, when Isaiah lets them know, and for, in fact, I need you to read verses one through five on your own, but verse five is what I want to zero in on. He says, come descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Here's a stark situation. I read it, the first few verses in chapter one where the Lord said, your whole head is sick. The donkey knows its master. The ox knows its master, but yet my people don't know me. They don't hear or recognize my voice. Their whole head is sick. But what is the solution? Isaiah tells us, those who walk in the light of the Lord. Well, we want to dissect that. We want to unpack and uncover and examine what does Isaiah mean here? Who or what is the light that he is referring to in Isaiah 2.5? Well, I think you are probably already have a good idea, but I want to underscore this because it has tremendous theological significance for us, but also on how we put this into practice how this changes our daily existence. Who is this light? Well, the word light in Hebrew, it means light from heavenly bodies. In fact, we see in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 35. If you have your Bibles, I, I want you to turn there, but if not, read it on the screen with me. It is the Lord who provides the sun to light the day, and the moon and stars to light the night. And who stirs the sea into roaring waves? His name is the Lord of heaven's armies. And this is what he says. He is the one who is the light. God the Father. So when Isaiah is telling us, let us walk in the light of the Lord, we're talking about living 
and walking and existing in the brilliance, in the illumination of God and the brightness that he provides on the path he wants us to walk on. In Isaiah chapter 60 and verses 19 and 20, Isaiah further underscores this point. He says, no longer will you need the sun to shine by day, nor the moon to give its light by night, for the Lord your God will be your everlasting light. Lord have mercy. And your God will be your glory. Verse 20, your sun will never set. Your moon will not go down for the Lord will be your everlasting light. Your days of mourning will come to an end. Now, this is extremely significant because when you look at how Isaiah is written and how the book is, is sectioned, chapters 1 through 39 gives us the, the, the denunciations and the judgments that God is is pronouncing upon Israel, upon Judah, because they have forsaken the Lord. But verse uh, chapters 40 to the end of the book gives the message of restoration, of promise, that there will be a remnant that will come out of Judah. There will be that part of the original who have kept their faith and their fidelity and their commitment to the Lord. So here Isaiah is telling us, Listen, the Lord your God will be your everlasting light. I like that because an everlasting light is like everlasting life. It never goes out. It never diminishes. It never grows dim. It remains brilliant. It never loses its glory. It has the ability to illuminate not only your path, but your mind and your heart, your soul and your spirit when your path is dark. This is why Isaiah says you need to walk in the light of the Lord, walking in the light that God provides to you, his guidance, his protection, the power of his presence. This is how we walk. This is how we live. Though we might be overcome by shadows, by death, by despair, by hopelessness, by conditions that seem bleak and dark and dire. I think of the of the apostles who are there in that prison cell. They are praying, their feet are in stocks. They are praying and singing and at midnight there is a great earthquake, Paul, <laughs> and his traveling companion have been beaten. They are bloodied. They are bruised. They are wounded. They believe that death is at the door. The executioners, they can hear them outside. They can hear their proverbial steps. But at midnight, the brilliance and the light of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, there is an earthquake the doors of the prisons fly open. The chains on their hands and in their feet fall off. And all of the other doors of the prisoners, of, of the cells of the other prisoners are there. And the guard comes out, draws his sword, ready to kill himself, to commit suicide because he knows the penalty of the Roman soldiers. He knows that if prisoners escape, his life will be taken. And Paul cries out, don't do yourself any harm. We are all here. Now they're in prison. Situation looks bad. Their backs are up against the wall. They have been wrongly accused. They have been beaten. Paul is a Roman citizen. I'm talking about walking in the light of the Lord, the brilliance of God, where here Isaiah is saying, God will be your everlasting light. Now, Isaiah gives us a proleptic glimpse of this dynamic of God and the light that leads us to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. 
and the city has no need of sun or moon for the glory of God illuminates the city and the lamb is its light. Now I'm here by myself in my office preaching and I'm telling you right now, I'm getting excited. I'm ready for to tell somebody, hold my mule while I shout because Isaiah tells us in chapter 60 of his book, the Lord is our everlasting light. And that same theme transfers all the way from Isaiah to the end of time that is captured in the book of Revelation where John the Revelator, John the Beloved tells us the city, that holy city, New Jerusalem, where you and I will reside, where our citizenship is recorded in the book of life, where I don't have to worry about voters' rights. I don't have to worry about a board of electors. I don't have to worry about real estate agents or redlining. In that city, there will be no need for the sun nor the moon for the Lord is illuminating the city and the lamb is its light. Now, Revelation 22 and verse five, John goes on. He says, and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever. I hope you're getting this. You see, when Isaiah tells the people in chapter two, verse five, let us walk in the light of the Lord. You continue to walk in the light of the Lord while you're here on this earth. Guess what? In Revelation 21 and Revelation 22 lets me know that when we get to heaven and when we are in that new Jerusalem, in the city of God, whose builder and maker is God, there'll be no need for the sun anymore, nor the moon, for the glory of the Lord is shining there and the lamb is the light. That's why you and I need to walk in the light of the Lord today, tomorrow and the next day and every day until we see him coming in the clouds of glory or I close my eyes in the sleep of death only to be resurrected in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, walking in the light. When I am walking in the light and when you are walking in the light, that gives us the fortitude, the power, and the ability to meet the challenges that are facing the church today. God, the Father, is the light. So when we are walking in the light, we're walking in the illumination and the brilliance and the radiance of the Father. That same radiance that I'm experiencing today is what I'm going to see in the fullness of its glory in that new Jerusalem, in the earth made new. Well, God is the light, but I have additional good news for you today. Jesus is the light. And I know y'all knew I was going there. Jesus is the light. John chapter one and verses one verses four and nine. In John chapter one verses four and nine. And then also chapter eight and verse 12. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. Jesus' life brought light to everyone. Verse 9, the one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Jesus Christ is the light. We know that Isaiah is one of the premier Old Testament books, the premier prophet that gave the messianic prophecies foretelling that Jesus Christ would come out of the tribe of Judah through the lineage of King David. He would be the one that would be the rightful heir to the throne. He would be the one that would ascend to heaven after being rescued from the tomb and seated at the right hand of the father in a place in the place of authority, our high priest who is there interceding on our behalf. He 
the word of God tells us, is the light that gives life and light to everyone. So when Isaiah says, walk in the light of the Lord, he's saying, you got to walk in the light of the Father and of the Son. John 8 and verse 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit will take these passages that no doubt we have read hundreds of times, multiple times, and that we can recite verbatim without even thinking about it. But my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will take this truth and these truths and these words and they will be burned and an impression made in our hearts, our minds and our spirits that we will understand the gravity, the significance and the power that is here in this word and in this message. This is what Isaiah wanted to get the people of Judah to understand. And this is the significance and the importance for you and for me. You see, if I'm not walking in the light of the Lord, if I don't understand that God is the light and Jesus is the light, then what are we here for? What are we actually doing? Even with our ministries to the community, the food distribution and other ministries that will be announced and that are forthcoming, all of these things are important and they're necessary and they're good. But if we're not walking in the light in the light of the Lord, and we're going to find out what does this walking mean in just a minute, and then I'm going to let you go home. <laughs> well, isn't that something? You're already home. I'm going to let you be able to turn the station. If we don't understand and experience this, then all of these good works and things that we're doing, what did Jesus say to the people that said, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not feed the hungry? Did we not clothe the naked? Didn't we do all of these things in your name? And what does Jesus say? Depart from me. I never knew you. Not, I don't know you. I never knew you. What disqualified them was that they were not walking in the light of the Father and in the light of Jesus Christ the one who is the light of the world. And if you follow him, he is that light that leads to life. So do you want to have everlasting life? Follow Jesus. You want to experience the joy of salvation? Accept and follow Jesus. You want to have the perfect peace that passeth all understanding. You want to be able to move beyond religious vernacular and religious speakeasy and experience the transforming power of an indwelling Holy Spirit. Follow the light that leads to Jesus, that leads to life. Well, what does walking in the light mean? And now I'm getting ready to close. What does walking in the light mean? Uh, walking really means living. It is living in Jesus. It, it is Jesus who is now living in me, who activates, who motivates, who inspires, and who empowers and transforms me. In John chapter 12 and verse 46, Listen to what Jesus says. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, 6, 5, verse, 
chapter 5 and verse 8. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live, so live as people of light. In other words, it is not enough to have an intellectual relationship with truth where I merely agree and assent to the theological truths or premises or propositions. The truth has to penetrate this exterior shell of my body and it has to reach the heart and the soul and the mind and the spirit of my being because the transformation begins on the inside and works its way outward. It is not the opposite. It starts on the outside and works in. No, it comes in. We internalize this. We are walking. That means then that, that, that John tells us in 1 John 1 and verse 7, he says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So there is this cleansing action, this purification that takes place as I'm following Jesus and walking in the light. I'm having fellowship with my brothers and my sisters because this Religious journey is meant to be done in community. It is not a solo practitioner experience. It is done in the, in the confines of the body of believers. So I have fellowship with, with each other. This is why the word says, forsake not yourselves, the assembly of your, the assembling of yourselves together, coming to church. We are a part of a community. That is what the early church did. They went from house to house before they had a building, before they had a structure. But there is also fellowship that we experience with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this goes back to what Isaiah was saying in chapter two and verse five, walk in the light. I've got to live in it. I've got to live in Jesus, living in his word. Walking in the light also means that that means I have to learn how to wait on God. Waiting on him. Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 2. Isaiah 33 and verse 2. But Lord, be merciful to us, for we have waited for you. Be our strong arm each day and our salvation in times of trouble. Now that Hebrew word for wait there is kava. It means to bind together, to twist, to intertwine, and to lock. In other words, waiting on God means that I am depending on and I'm ordering my activities around a future event. That's what the definition is of this Hebrew word, kava, of waiting on God. My life is structured. I am waiting around a future event. What is that future event? When God intervenes and when God speaks to me. Because I am trusting him. I am depending upon him. And this is what Isaiah needed to get the people of Judah to understand. Even though they were going through difficult times and hardships and trials because of their disobedience. But God still had a message of hope and restoration and reclamation for them. Psalm 27 verse 14, listen to what David says. Come on, Vashon. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Isaiah closes with this in Isaiah 40 and verse 29. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Verse 30, even the youth shall fail, shall faint 
and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, I know my time is gone, but I could preach another sermon just on this. We got to wait on him. So while I'm walking in the light of the Lord, I'm living in him, but I'm also learning how to wait on him. Sometimes Jesus says yes. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says not yet. Sometimes he says wait. But he's going to renew your strength. He's going to illuminate your paths. He is going to come in and smooth out those rough places and give you the strength and the energy and the resilience that you so desperately need. So what is the conclusion of the whole matter? My last passage for today. What is the conclusion of this matter? First Peter chapter two and verse nine, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isn't that what Isaiah said? Walk in the light of the Lord. It's, you no longer have to stumble in darkness. Reminds me of the song that uh, 1971, the group war came out with the song, Slipping Into Darkness. I was slipping into darkness. There is no need for you to slip. There is no need for us to stumble, meandering around, losing our sense of presence and bearing. Jesus is the light. You have the ability to walk in the illumination of God the Father, of Jesus Christ, and of his Holy Spirit, whom he has given to those who obey him, to those who love him. And you then become a member of that chosen generation. And the blessed promise that you and I have is one day soon Jesus is coming back and when we are transported to glory and we are there in heaven living for a thousand years during the millennium and at the end of that millennium we return to the new heaven and the new earth and in that city that has 12 gates <laughs> There'll be no need for the sun to rule the day or the moon to rule the night for the glory of God will be its light for the lamb is the light. Let him light up your heart today by accepting him as your Lord and Savior. If that is your prayer, then I invite you to pray with me now. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the power of your word that you have assured us that when we walk and live in you, we will have fellowship with one another and that your blood cleanses us because as we follow you, you are the light that leads to life. Life that is original, underived, and unborrowed. Life that will be eternal, that begins today, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you today. Now is the time for us to respond to God's love and provisions. Let us return a thankful tithe and give our generous 
free will offerings. CCC members may do so by using our online giving link on our church website on your screen. Thank you for being faithful as he is faithful. For those of you who are viewing our service for the very first time, or perhaps you have been viewing on occasion and have been blessed by this ministry and would like to support it, you can make a donation to the church by using your PayPal and or Cash app as indicated on the screen. Thanks to all for your support. Thank you for fellowshipping with us here at Columbia Community Center. May God be victorious in your life this week, and we look forward to worshiping with you again next Sabbath.